you to read this. Gardening is the fine art of soul to soil. And that pretty much describes my philosophy on gardening. You have to love it. Nobody in their right mind would go stand out in the hot sun and pull weeds and do all that you need to do if you didn't love it. But it's so easy to love. And the rainbow signifies the fact that the end of it is my garden, which is my pot of gold. And this is just one of my flower beds. This is a shade bed. You will see hostas, heucheras, the still be various different flowers in there. These are digitalis, foxglove. Beautiful color range. Those plants are approximately three and a half to four feet tall and they like shade. This is a sunnier portion of my bed. The purple is lithrum. The pink in the front is uh, an echinacea. The blue is a verbena. I love just the different combinations of all the plants. The orange is a poppy, and then there are peonies in the background. Uh, you might spot a few weeds in there, but I won't say anything if you don't. Gardening is to me, a very relaxing hobby, occupation. I don't get paid for it. I just love doing it. Uh, this is Phlox, some Black-Eyed Susans, Tiger Lilies, Minardia, and Irises, and a Yucca. And it, yes, a Yucca, that is its name. It doesn't mean it's yucky, though my husband might disagree with me on that. Another section here I have. Uh, Rudbeckias, daylilies, irises. They all live together. They're, they're all good friends. They uh, grow well together. The nicest thing that you can do for yourself is learn enough culture of the plants so that when you group them together, they like the same thing. The shade ones all want more shade and bright sunshine which usually means they need more moisture. The sun ones, I don't know how, sometimes in the summer months, they can just stand there and take that hot sun. You gotta remember when it's 95 to 100 degrees, they're out in pure sunlight. And what all I'm showing you primarily are perennials, shrubs and the trees. That means they come up. Now in my garden, in my little world, there are a lot of visitors. That's my husband, that's not his best side, but this is a heron on the way, our church is close by and my husband and I and our grandchildren were coming back from the church and we found this heron in the middle of the road. It has a broken leg. I did a lot of phone calling trying to find some place that it could be taken to. Finally found out through um, a sports column in the commercial news, got the number of uh, Van Camp, and he told me how to get a hold of the University of Illinois. And we did take this heron over there, and they did help heal the bird, broken leg, and all. Our grandkids still talk about that. They thought that was fantastic. During the winter months, you can see we have a lot of visiting birds. And here in a couple weeks, this little guy you see in this picture feeding from Salvia is a hummingbird. We have a lot of hummingbirds. As you can see, they're on all of the feeders. I have four feeders with 10 holes in this where these are hanging. So I often will have 40 of them all there together. They're fascinating little creatures. Uh, the fact that I have so many flowers attracts them. And then we could go into a lot of detail on hummingbirds, what attracts them and how to keep them there. This is a little visitor. It's just a little fawn. We have one deer that comes by each year. She usually brings two fawns with her and they come by to visit and take part in my buffet. You can see there comes a couple more, but the garden attracts people and it also attracts wildlife. The eastern bluebird, my son has built me several houses for that. Bluebirds were almost becoming extinct in Illinois. 
but due to homeowners' interest and gardeners' interest, so many bluebird homes have been built and sited correctly that they've made a terrific comeback. Just such a beautiful bird. Uh, this is the owner of the garden. This is my cat, Duchess. She was a stray that got dumped out. I told her she couldn't live there. So she proceeded to follow me from bed to bed and lay at my feet. And as I say, she now owns the place. This was a nice little discovery my husband made. You often tell me, trying to trick me and say, oh, there's a snake. Well, this time he said it, there really was one. Big old black snake just hanging down from uh, my maple tree. This is another visitor that will be coming very soon within the next two weeks. Baltimore Orioles, Orchard Orioles, um, just a little bit difference in the tone of orange. If you have seen them and wondered how to attract them, put out grape jelly. When I first heard of using grape jelly, I took the lid off of a spray can, filled it full of cheap grape jelly, and just set it up on a uh, feeder, had sunflower seeds. And within a half an hour, I had an Oreo and the family has grown from there. Fascinating birds to watch, very vocal, fun to watch them raise their young and they will bring the babies up there and literally push them off so that they learn to fly. But uh, very good friends to have at the garden. This is a gross beak and his beak is much, much larger. Gross, I wouldn't go with, but he's very colorful. They come early in the spring and a very attractive bird. Cardinals, they're at my house year round. And this is a yellow, yellow berried, bellied sapsucker. There really is a bird by that name. He's there all winter and all summer. Love sunflower seeds. We also have a few other visitors that I would not like to have. Uh, this is a possum, came up to eat the cat's food just for a visit. The raccoon is eyeing up what he might get into. Very destructive little creatures, just as cute as can be, but very destructive. And this was my grandson's frog, Speedy. Uh, he picked him up as just a little tiny, he was past the tadpole pole stage, but he kept him for quite some time, even had him in an aquarium in the house. But Speedy always come up on the pond. This is something that I do with the leaves of some of my plants. This is a pumpkin leaf. I cast them in concrete and then paint them. Uh, it's a fun hobby. You can do it on, on quite a wide range of plants, but I have them scattered all through the garden. And in the fall, I like to decorate pumpkins. This is some more of the flower beds. We have paths through these. The grandkids like to run through them and uh, they're getting older now. I miss that. I love watching them just run through the beds. When we have the Easter egg hunt in the spring, of course, the plants are not up high. Uh, Easter, I believe, is April 4th this year. So we'll have some vegetation up. But I used to worry that if I planted the eggs in there that they would trample everything. But overall, they've been quite careful. There are my four oldest grandchildren when they were younger. There is a fifth one. This is her. She cried when she saw that picture because she thought I just didn't let her be in the picture. Why wouldn't you let me come, Grandma? And I told her she wasn't born for another five years, but it didn't console her. We also have our great niece who is actually quite the gardener. She, as you see, both of them are fascinating. All that is is just a simple preformed pond, but it might as well be a 40 acre lake to the grandkids. There's always something to see in there. Uh, a lot of tadpoles grow into great big frogs, which they really like to see. Once again, this is the hostas getting ready to bloom. 
there are so many varieties of hostas. You don't have to uh, worry about the blooms. Some of the blooms are quite attractive, but just a different vari variation of the colors. This is more of a my grandma's flower garden. Everybody's in bloom and, and that. We have some hibiscus, some salvia, and knockout roses. Knockout roses are a good place to start if you want to try roses. I have a lot of the tiger lilies. I love the color orange. This is the garden in the fall. You'll notice there are mums. The grasses are starting to dry. But I like still the color. This is from a redbud tree that blooms early in the spring. That'll happen soon. And that's this entire bed is covered in uh, crab apple, dogwood, white, pink, and red. Um, the flowering trees are just so beautiful. They, they really say spring to me because they're just nothing that duplicates that massive amount of flowers. Uh, I raise a lot of my own plants. These are delphiniums and poppies. They go nicely together. And uh, these, as I said before, are perennials. This is another bed that I have a lot of heuchera, coral bells. That's what is all across the front. You have the benefit of their beautiful foliage all summer long and they will bloom. Some white, some pink. Actually, there's a few that have almost a reddish bloom on them. They attract hummingbirds and uh, they're a very well-mannered plant. They're not invasive. Uh, no, no major problems with them but I do like the foliage. And I would think that by now they couldn't come up with a different coloration for the leaves, but every spring, there's at least a dozen new ones out there. This is hibiscus, this cranberry crush, huge, huge blooms, plant them in full sun. And uh, for about a month and a half, it's just covered in gigantic blooms. This is a Brigmansia. It's actually a tropical plant. I grow it in a big pot next to my porch just for the fragrance of it. This is a combination of the fall mums and profusion zinnia. The orange is, a is the zinnia. I love, they go so well together. From a distance, just in this picture, you cannot tell which is the mum and which is the zinnia. That's why I like to put them together. The zinnia will bloom until it freezes and it just kind of fills out. I have some orange and blue there. And right now with the Illini in the uh, NCAA, I think that's a, a good color combination. Hydrangeas, love hydrangeas. This is Twist and Shout. It's a shorter variety. It's about two and a half feet tall shade. You do have to give it the aluminum sulfate if you want it blue, or you can just let whatever color your soil brings it up, which is usually a pink to maybe a lavender shade. One of the other beds, just from a, a different angle. I love seeing the mass of flowers. For my beds, July is probably my highest bloom time. Seems like almost everything is in bloom at that time. This is a plant that I received from my grandmother when I was a child. She lost her mother when my grandmother was five years old. This plant was given to her by an aunt and she always said that was the only thing she had of her mother's. And that's, plants are good for that. If you have something that belonged to a loved one, a friend, they're called pass along plants. And you just share them with someone else who means a lot to you. And it builds a nice tradition. This is a huge shrub rose. Thorny is all get out, but the fragrance on this ragosa is fantastic. It will have a big flush of bloom, then it will go uh, dormant for a while and some more sporadic blooms. This is an oak leaf hydrangea. 
leaves are just fantastic in the fall. It's a thing to consider when you choose plants, how many seasons are you going to get? This is Lion King Japanese iris. That is around six to seven inches across. Huge bloom. Circle flower, love the yellow. It has such stiff stems. It really stays erect and shows off its blooms. Highly recommend it. It's a Lismachia circle flower. My favorite hosta, Liberty, Betany. It's first cousins to lamb's ear, if any of you are familiar with lamb's ear. Lamb's ear is a silver velvety plant that you grow mostly just for foliage, but they're first cousins. Pomegranate, Achillea, Yarrow. It, uh, love the color of it and how it presents itself. It will be covered with butterflies. Butterflies like a flat bloom such as that. They feel safe landing on it. There is a, just another bed of hollyhocks, clematis, the rugosa, yucca, and probably half a dozen other things that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Shea garden. I have caladium and oxalis and many hostas. This is just a, a statue I believe my daughter-in-law gave me. I kind of like the looks of it there by the gate. The yuccas again, those yuccas blooms, by the way, are about six feet tall. After they bloom, you cut off the flowering stem. And I like the foliage. Um, nobody will really walk through it. It's, it's pretty spiky, but it's still attractive. Elephant ears, the black and the green, they don't bloom, but I do like how they look. They give a nice jungle effect. I often put them around that little pond I showed you. I told you I started my own seeds. This is about this time of the year. This is after they've grown for a while and they got even bigger. Then a lot of them go out into the vegetable garden. That one's a lot of work because there's a lot of bare soil. So you get, the more bare soil you have, the more weeds you have because that's just what they do for us. Now, my produce gets some good size. This is a big Zach tomato. As you can see, it's weighing in at three and a half pounds. I like to grow peppers. These are big Berthas, and I believe that's orange blaze in the background. I don't know if you can, it's like the ruler got chopped off, but that pepper is around seven or eight inches long. Peppers and tomatoes are in the same family. They like the same thing, hot, hot temperatures. This is, this is a bed that, my most recent bed that I started as you can see, it's just a mix of, I plant by if I have room for it, and if I fall in love with it at the nursery, I will find room for it. If that involves digging up some grass to increase the bed, I've been known to do that. This is my pot patty. She sits out on the stump, keeps an eye on things. She's fairly lazy. She doesn't do a bit of work, but she does like it. Here I have irises and day lilies in bloom. They like the same thing. They like the hot sun. You don't have to be, you don't have to speak botanical to plants. So many people say, oh, I wouldn't be able to learn all those names. Well, you don't have to. A plant is not impressed if you speak to it by its botanical name. Give it a nickname or just enjoy it and it returns the love. At least that's what works for me. As you can see here in the hostas, we've got a lot more blooms in it on this set, section. You have yellow hostas, dark green hostas, striped hostas, uh, green and white variegated. I'll show you a close up of a few of the friends. Black swallowtail that's on a butterfly bouche. This is a yellow swallowtail, 
on a pink butterfly bush, very fragrant plant. This is a monarch on a Mexican sunflower. I love that orange color on there, and so do the monarchs. And another swallowtail just on an orange zinnia. And this is one perhaps you don't see often. You have to look in the evening as a rule for it. This is a sphinx moth. It comes around to visit. Some people call them hummingbird moths because they have the same feeding. They have a tube comes out and they feed on the nectar where the hummingbird has a tongue that does this. But a lot of people think those are hummingbirds, but he's actually a moth. He's good size, about two and a half to three inches. And this is a little spring peeper. Last week or so when we thought it was spring, we heard a lot of them. And another swallowtail. They're, I think they're beautiful when they're at rest like that. And uh, their wings are spread apart. Once again, these are flower blooms that are fairly flat on the top that really attracts a butterfly. Now, this guy is a horn tomato worm. He's on a pepper plant. He, uh, he is not a desirable friend to the garden. He will strip the leaves off your pepper or tomato quickly. After gardening all year, this is a katydid. When you start to hear katydids, then they start to sing in the fall, late summer to fall. My grandmother always said it was six weeks until summer was over. You were going to have a killing frost. She was always right. And there comes, I have a lot of sassafras trees. The leaves, I love the bright orange. And this is a guy, he really wasn't from my garden, but he just reflected how I feel after a long summer. And we're at the end of the day in the garden. I hope you enjoyed a walk through my garden. It was really a fast walk, but sometimes when the extension goes back to having live garden walks, I have been on it several times. So perhaps this will plant a seed of curiosity that you will want to come and go on our garden walks. All of us gardeners like to talk about plants just about as much as we like to plant them. So if you're ever thinking of gardening, uh, track your, down a master gardener. They'll be more than happy to help. And if any of you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Jenny is not back up here yet with some questions. I'm not technologically smart enough to operate all of this Zoom equipment. <laughs> Pat, it was a wonderful presentation. I don't see here. Um, there is one from um, Rita in the chat box. And thank you, Rita. Rita said your garden is lovely. And could you tell them a little bit more about bluebird houses? Bluebird houses have to be... Uh, made to strict specifications. The reason for that is the whole, and I didn't think to bring them with you, but the extension office has information on that we can get to you. But it is not a standard birdhouse with a gable. It's flat. It has, I believe it's a one inch hole in it. And the reason for that is to try to deter other birds. Bluebird houses, Snakes love to get in there and take the eggs. Other birds like to come in and uh, they'll actually kill the young. Uh, so if it's not made to strict specifications, it opens them up to a, a lot of predators. But we certainly can get the information. If you have a way of giving that to Jenny, uh, we, we have the diagram with all the numbers on it for you. Anyone else have a question? Yes, Pat. Um, Sheila asked um, how to attract hummingbirds to your garden. Well, first of all, when hummingbirds come, they look around for a good place to eat. And they have probably the best memory of any animal I know. If they come and you do not have anything, they say, see you around, I'm going where the food's good. So I would suggest to you, this is what I do, by 
the first week in April, put up a feeder. You can buy a fancy feeder or a plain Jane, just be sure it's red or a bright orange. The red color does attract a hummingbird's eye. If you uh, like, you can hang out red ribbons, um, anything red. I make my own food. It's four cups. It's a four to one mixture. Um, one cup sugar to four cups water. It's best to boil your water first to get any impurities out. Add your sugar, get it dissolved in there, then let it cool and put it out. When you're first starting in the year or just first starting with hummingbirds, say your hummingbird feeder, uh, get you a, a small one, fill it up about half full. Hang it out in a prominent place to where you'll see it. As I say, hang some red ribbons, red cloth, something out there so he notices, ah, interesting, I'll come over and look and leave the food in that for two or three days. You don't want the food to spoil because if they come and eat food that is spoiled, they also remember that. But hang them out the first week in April because it all depends on the weather. I don't know if the tornadoes and such that they've just recently had in the South will slow them down but they start coming up. I almost always have had hummingbirds up by April 16th, but I put my feeder out, put it out on Easter weekend. That would be a good project you can do for yourself and your summer enjoyment or have a grandchild help you. And that way they're ready. Keep an eye on the food, keep the food, the feeder clean at all times. So if you put it in there on a Monday, by Thursday, check that. In the early spring, it won't spoil as fast as it does in the summer, but sugar will ferment and sour. And when it does that, the hummingbirds will not eat it. Um, and if you like the Oreos, they usually come about the same time, uh, put out the grape jelly and between the hummingbirds and the Oreos, it's like you have a constant visitor. It's a, a very enjoyable way to spend the summer. Anyone else? Um, Pat, yes, you had, um, let me see, uh, Ann Campbell asked, said that your garden is beautiful, and how many acres do you have? We have three and a half acres total, probably an acre of it is in flower beds. I started out helping my husband, you see there would be difficult spots, hilly areas and such that I decided were hard to cut with the mower, so I put a flower bed there, and then I added a few things. Unfortunately, I haven't seemed to reach my quota yet. I, I just love doing what I'm doing, and as I get older, I find out that the maintenance is a little harder, but there's nothing I'd rather be doing than out in my garden, so... Uh, uh, what is it if you love your job, you've never worked in a day in your life? So it's it's sort of that kind of thing. Pat, yes. there's another question, and this is on one of your favorite flowers from Karen. Said she does not have any success with delphinium and is wondering if you can give her some tips. Well, except the fact that they're a very, very gluttonous eater. Um, maybe in New England or over in Britain, they grow with less problems than they do here. They do not like our summers. The winter does not bother them. So what I do, I plant it in the best soil I have, then I amend it more. I uh, compost. Uh, you don't have to fertilize a lot. Give it a rich soil. Um, Side it correctly. It, I give mine about a half day sunshine, half day shade. It likes a little afternoon shade. The heat really does bother it. Put it, to, as I say, side it there in as good a soil as you can give it. Be sure it does not dry out. Stake it while it's young. And the delphiniums that I have, the old. Uh, the taller variety ones, uh, Pacific Giants, 
they will get almost six feet tall, including the bloom. So you want to do um, a stake, a wire, some apparatus to hold them up. Because as you can imagine, if that was in bloom today when we had this high wind, it'll snap it right off and oh, it'll just make you want to sit down and cry because uh, you've worked so hard to get it there. But the richness of it and be sure on the moisture and pretty much that'll do, that'll take care of the trick. Um, after it blooms, that flower stalk, cut it back to the ground. And I sometimes, on those few blessed years that uh, everything just works right with the weather, you will even get some supplemental blooms. And they won't be as large, but they, they're kind of a test for me. If I can get my delphinium to bloom, I feel as though I've really worked hard that summer. But they do like a lot of extra food, just putting them in the ground and not feeding them. I usually use a fertilizer with the middle number, the highest, the phosphorus, and follow the directions of whichever one you purchase. And that gives them just that little extra to set more buds into blooms. They are just glorious when they're in bloom. Though I've always thought they should have a fragrance for all the work you have to go through. But I agree, they're, they're one of my very favorites. Anyone um, else? Pat, there was a question on um, where do you like to buy your perennials? Oh, to be honest, whoever's selling them probably. Uh, I, I, if I'm allowed to give a plug, I go to Sunrise Nursery in Grant Park, Illinois. Um, I order from several different catalogs, uh, Brex, Roots and Rhizomes, Bluestone, and a lot of them I raise from seed myself. The poppies, uh, the delphiniums, lupines. I don't think I showed you a picture of a lupine in this series. Um, I, I do all those from, from seed. They grow as easy as a, a zinnia seed. So they're not hard. You just have to plan ahead and give a lot of extra time for that. But uh, don't be afraid of, of trying to grow a perennial from seed. I grow my own butterfly bushes from seed. Go out in February if you already have one or if you know of someone that has it and didn't cut it off. Uh, just pick off a dead bloom, put it down in a brown lunch sack and shake it real hard and all the seeds will fall into that. Put it over uh, moist soil and uh, lay a piece of plastic over it until they sprout and you will have hundreds of butterfly bushes. Uh, they grow quite easily from seed and they will last for many, many years. Um, Pat, the, so yeah. there were a few more questions here. Um, one was on how do you keep ants out of hummingbird feeders. Um, I use ant moats. I don't know yes. if you use anything else. No, I, I don't. Ant moats are about the only thing you can do. And one other little housekeeping thing, if when you're filling your feeders, if you spill some on the outside, take a damp cloth and wipe that off. I found just not having the sticky substance on the outside helps. But the Biggest deterrent are ant moats. There's just no other question. And if you get wasp wiping that off, the hummingbirds don't really mind the wasp. The ants, if they get in the food, usually the hummingbird will turn away after a couple ants get in there. It sours the water. Okay. Um, and then there was a question um, for the sphinx moth. Um, it was feeding on a white flower, I believe. What was that flower it was Pasta. feeding on? Pasta. Hosta, okay. Aphrodite Hosta. I took a series of pictures of it. I have that Hosta right next to uh, our patio. And I was sitting there and he buzzed past me. So I ran and got the camera and just had a lot of fun taking pictures of him uh, feeding off that big bloom right there. Um, but you don't see them as often, but they do come out toward evening more. And I think that's why we're just not out where they're at. Okay. And then there was another question on the yellow flower that you talked about that you passed from generation to generation. It was from Missouri your Primrose. Missouri Primrose? 
Missouri primrose. It's a nonethra is its actual botanical name. It is a little hard to find because it's considered an old fashioned flower. It's not carried by nurseries. But once in a while you will find it. Um, look in catalogs, uh, as I said, with Bluestone, um, Gilbert Wilde, different ones. Sometimes they will have that. That's a good one if you find someone that has it, that they will share a piece with you. I would just be devastated if I lost that plant just because of the connection to my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother taught me a lot about gardening or perhaps she just gave the love of it to me. Um, but uh, yes, it, it's not a spectacular plant. It, it blooms in the spring. The foliage is a green tinted red when it comes up and then those blooms, it just covers itself in them. But uh, to me, the connection is because it was, was my grandmother's. Okay, um, and then they wanted to know the name of the nursery that you like to go to in Grant Park. It's called Sunrise, Woldhurst, W-O-L-D-H-U-I-S Nursery. It will be listed under Sunrise and under Woldhurst. It's actually, uh, it was a family farm. And during earlier times back in the 80s, they came on hard times because of farm prices. They started a farmer's market just for supplemental income. Well, someone in the family had the same illness I have on plants. So they started adding plants and it's 12 acres under glass and they have a wonderful supply of perennials, annuals, trees and shrubs and their prices are excellent. Um, but do try out some of the catalogs too. Uh, you can just type in on Google. Uh, you notice I don't know anything technological, but I can find a catalog. Uh, but you just type in perennial gardens, perennial plants, and half a dozen different sites will pop up. Now remember when you do order, if you order from a catalog, the plant is going to be smaller because of the shipping. And that's why I have shifted some from catalog buying to Sunrise because it's already in a gallon pot. And uh, they, they've done the early work for me. Wonderful people up there. They are knowledgeable about what they sell and they will answer your questions as long as you have them. It's just an excellent place to go to. Um, and then there was a question um, and a nice comment from Karen Marley, who said, your pictures are absolutely gorgeous. What type of camera do you use? Well, that's a uh, Canon 35 millimeter. Uh, the older pictures were taken on. And then some of the newer ones were taken with my cell phone. It's just a, an, an Apple. I don't even remember what number on it now. I've, I've had it quite a few years, but uh, once again, it's just like we're with the leaf castings and stuff. All of that just seems to go together. I'm not the only one. Most of us master gardeners, when we get to have meetings, we all come armed with, oh, I've got to show you this on our picture. You know, it may be a tulip, it may be a hydrangea, whatever it is. We all like to take pictures to share and to show each other. But uh, I, I have learned how to get some of the pictures up close, which was my goal. I never could master that. Finally read the book and found out there are ways if you read the instructions. So uh, thank you for noticing that uh, my camera work sometimes is better than my other skills. Um, Pat and then Karen wrote, um, hard to believe you are growing lupins here because they are hard to grow here. They are hard to grow here. Once again, they're just the same as a delphinium. They really don't like it here. Uh, I grow them from seed. I will get maybe three years out of them. Sometimes one a stray one will grow a little bit longer. Don't care. I love the plant. I think it's just such a beautiful, dignified plant. And the color range is fabulous. So, uh, Find a package of seeds, soak them overnight in water, plant them as the instructions say. 
they grow quickly. They will usually have a few blooms even this first year if you get started early. But yes, they do not like Illinois, I'm afraid. They would be much happier on the East Coast or the Pacific Northwest or somewhere. Um, if you've never smelled one, uh, a lupin smells like salt and pepper, or that's how the fragrance comes to me. But I just love them. I think the color is uh, just striking. I, I guess the combination of them with the white and the dark color, it just really strikes a note with me. And I think that is about it. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. I don't know if anybody else has a question. It doesn't look like it. So it looks like we might be done with the presentation and the segment with questions. Thank you, thank you. It was wonderful on a gray day to see that much color. Isn't it the truth? The best time to look at flowers is, and catalog providers all send out their catalogs so that we get them in the middle of winter. Everything looks good. Well, all of your garden space looks wonderful. I can't imagine the hours and the years that you've put into it. Well, but I truly hope when we get to garden walks that you'll be on a garden walk for us. Well, I, I will be on. If not, I you'll find some gardens that make mine look kind of like a weed patch. So you'll enjoy looking at them. Um, we could have had a two hour, I'd like to do it where I kind of showcase each variety, but because of the time we had, I tried to just do an overview of them because I just don't know when to stop talking about plants when I get started. But thank you for inviting me and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Greatly appreciated. And if any other members wish to unmute at this point, and uh, which I say, pictures or otherwise, if you wish to show your smile and thank the team, that this would be the point to unmute. Yeah, this is great. Thanks. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Illinois Club. And a happy spring to all of you. Stay well and stay in touch so that I know how to share this recording with others that didn't make it tonight. I will do that. I will send you a link. It'll uh, take me a little bit of time to do a bit of editing and then I will send that on to you. And thank you very much for asking us to give you a presentation. Appreciate it. Stay well. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.